Hi there, I'm Tom Spencer. This week on Central Texas Gardener, take a dip into water on the Austin Pond Society tour. With ideas for every style and space, see why ponds, streams, and fountains turn a beautiful garden into an extraordinary one. In Georgetown, discover what prompted a design that became a favorite hangout. Daphne answers your top questions and makes her pick of the week. And John Dromkul shows why grafted tomatoes are such a hit. So let's get growing right here, right now. Support for Central Texas Gardener comes from GeoGrowers, offering custom soil blends for lawns, gardens, xeriscaping, and organic landscaping supplies. More information at geogrowers.net. Before they bought their new house, Claudia and Roddy Hubenthal had a vision for its garden. See what inspired them to build their ponds and stream, now a favorite hangout for the family and the wildlife. Long before Claudia and Roddy Hubenthal planned a pond for their new home in Georgetown, she was already keen on water gardening. This one was a step up from the small ones she'd built to entice the birds and other wildlife she loves. Actually, this design started a few years ago, even before they built their new house, when she and Ronnie ran into a find and pinned it to their imagination. Yep, that bridge is the key to this whole design. And so that was the reason we did the 45-foot stream. So we wanted an upper pond and a lower pond. And uh, I kind of drew out what I wanted, and then Hill Country Water Gardens came and they built it for us. Working mostly with the property's rocks that Claudia and Ronnie preserved during building, Hill Country Water Gardens had the know-how to layer them for a natural look. Claudia did modify one placement, the upper pond's ledge waterfall for visibility from the upstairs master bedroom. They also plan for vantage points all along their wraparound porch where they dine. The stream, just like a natural one, is an irresistible invitation to slow down and follow its tranquility. Midway, Claudia usually gathers a crowd with another serendipitous find. We were building the house. This rock was out in the front yard next to the trees. And I said, oh, I love this. I'm gonna make this my bird rock, the feature in the pond. And I didn't know exactly how it would work, but I knew that it was gonna be beautiful because it had all these little cups and places for the water to, to form. And I thought, what a perfect bird bath for the birds. Birds of all kinds head for the pond. Her camera is always nearby because I've always loved to photograph the birds, and I also paint birds. So after I photograph them, then I'll take those photographs and paint them. I always just love the wildlife. I mean, that's always been very special to me. Past the bridge, the stream ends at the lower pond, where 17-cent goldfish have grown into big extended families. Although Claudia is gardening under oak trees, she gets enough sun The back of the house faces east, and so the shade is good in the morning, and then in the summer, the west sun hits it in the afternoon, and we have more than six hours of sun. It's worked pretty well. Now, in the springtime, when the, the uh, oak blossoms are falling, it's been a lot more maintenance on the pond because you have to get in and empty the skimmer two or three times a week instead of just once a week like we do in the summertime. There's quite a bit of maintenance that goes with having the, the trees and the leaves and, you know, I've got a, a net that I run along the bottom and I scoop out, you know, leaves and things like that with it. Alfalfa pellets cleared up some algae problems. In just a year, their pond plants got so big that Ronnie's brother, Glenn Hubenthal of the Austin Pond Society, said it was time to repot and fertilize the water lilies come March. 
Eventually, they'll pass along divisions, since that's part of their heritage, like the irises Claudius planted in the gardens beyond the pond. So when I was a little girl in Denver, my mother um, went to this big estate that was closing down, and they allowed people to dig up anything they wanted to out of their gardens, and so she dug up these beautiful iris and uh, brought them to our house there in Denver, and we had them there for many, many years. And then when they moved to Abilene, she brought some of the starts from them, and she planted them there in Abilene. And then when my dad came to live with us and we were selling the house, um, this was after my mom had passed away, I wanted to bring a little bit of her with me. And so I brought some of the tubers with me in the fall and planted them, and now I moved them from that house to this house. With every blackberry, they'll remember their heritage from Ronnie's great aunt's garden. The pond's best pass along is with the next creative generation, their grandkids. They love it. First thing that they did was try to build the dam, though, and they, they ran most of the water out of it. They were very successful at their dam building. Thanks for sharing your garden, or in this case, your ponds with us. That pond will be featured in the Austin Pond Society's upcoming tour. And here to talk about the tours are Kathy Reagan and Carl Tinsley from the Austin Pond Society. Welcome back to Central Texas Gardener. Hi, Tom. Thanks. Thanks. This is a, a great day on the Austin gardening calendar. And this year you have a spectacular lineup of ponds. And we're just going to dive in and start showing people some of these wonderful places that they can visit. Carl, the first pond that we're featuring here uh, is an immediate immediate eye catcher. I've never seen an entry pond before like this. Yes, it's one of the most unique ponds I've ever seen uh, on the tour. And uh, the, at this house, they their entire entry courtyard to their house is a formal tiled pond with a marble slab walkway suspended over the top of it. It's just amazing. <laughs> so. yeah, it's like something out of uh, medieval Spain or something like that. It's absolutely beautiful. Yes, and it has a, a weeping wall and also an observation deck and stuff, so when people see it, they're just gonna be amazed. Yeah, you know, no weeping wall has disappearing fountains with beautiful ceramic uh, vessels, absolutely beautiful, uh, spectacular entry to this particular pond. Mm -hmm. And so uh, a great way to kind of entice people to go to the Austin Pond Society tour. Kathy, when's it gonna be this year? Uh, it's June 8th and 9th, uh, Saturday and Sunday. There will be ponds open from nine to five on Saturday and Sunday, the north on Sunday, on Saturday, pardon me, and the south on Sunday. Okay. And there'll also be two ponds open on Saturday night from eight to 10.30. Okay, and people can learn all about this at the Austin Pond Society website? That's right, yeah. austinpondsociety.org. All right, and so all the details are there, how people can get the tickets, et cetera. Let's dive back into the ponds here and, and take a look at the next one. This is The next one is a hill country pond. It's owned by a couple named Phil and Linda. Why don't you describe this one for That's me? That's right. They're uh, in the Anderson Mill area in uh, North Austin, and they have uh, developed their backyard to be a nice, relaxing place. Bruce goes out there and drinks his coffee and watches the pond every single morning. But it has uh, two ponds connected by a stream and uh, the, the water is directed into the lower pond that has fish in it and they have maidenhair ferns. It's just a gorgeous, relaxing place for their backyard. Okay, well, and exactly what people want from a pond. That's right. You know, That's that sense right. of tranquility. And uh, one of the cool features of the Pond Society Tour is that a lot of the owners will be out there and they can describe how they did it, right? That's right, and most of the ponds that we have on the tour this year are owner built. Mm -hmm. So they put their sweat and tears in and they really enjoy sharing that experience with people who come to visit. Of course, of course. The next pond we're gonna be talking about is owned by Mike and Andrea. This is a small formal pond with bog and lots of koi, right? Yeah, it's a really interesting what you can do in a, in a small space with a fairly small pond, um, but it's, uh, it's a formal pond, meaning it's not made to look natural. Mm -hmm. And uh, for a small pond, it has several very large koi in it. So it shows you with the right filtration and the right design that you can support large koi. Most people think you need a much larger space. Right, right. Now, one thing, Kathy, I know there's an issue. A lot of people want ponds, but they have trees, and they think that they can't have a pond underneath a tree. The next one we're going to be talking about, uh, owned by Mike and Ursula, actually is in the shade, right? Exactly. It's a little uh, small pond, and people think you have to have huge ponds, too, but theirs is only 600 gallons. Mm -hmm. It's nestled underneath a really large oak tree, and 
his idea of putting the pond there was so that it looked like you were on a ranch and you just happened upon this spring that came up uh, mm -hmm. in the corner of the ranch. So it is possible to have it under under trees, and it is there are some advantages to that. For instance, you don't get the algae problems that a lot of people have with sun ponds. Right. Well, and again, it has that sense of a little hidden oasis, right, which I right. think is really special. One of the really cool things about his pond too is uh, he doesn't have goldfish and koi. He went out to Brushy Creek and he got sunfish and bass and put those in his pond. <laughs> I think that's very so cool. So it's very interesting. Well, this is truly a regional pond tour. The next pond we're going to be talking about is in Hutto. This is uh, owned by a, a gentleman named Scott. Tell me about this one. Yeah, this one is very interesting because it's a brand new build. He just started to build it in March, if you can imagine that, and is on the pond tour. <laughs> but uh, it's really interesting because it's all masonry. He's mm -hmm. done it uh, from uh, sandstone stones, and it's a two-tier pond that is right nestled up to next to the deck. So I'm personally anxious to go back and see it with all of the plants in it. I'm, I'm sure it's going to be spectacular. Okay, so uh, this is a brand new brand addition. Brand new. And you get to talk to the owner who will be, I think, a little enthusiastic if it's brand <laughs> new. That's, that's right. Okay, the next one is in the Lakeway area, and this is uh, owned by a gentleman named Bruce, and it uh, includes uh, dry creek beds, multiple ponds. Right. Now, Bruce had, uh, had come... Uh, to a, a realization after the wildfires in 2011 that he had to do something with the cedar trees to get them away from his house. So he cleared all of those out and uh, wondered what was he going to do with all of this space. So he ended up uh, putting in a pond and he's incorporated a rain harvesting system, uh, dry creek beds, he's zero escaped his whole yard mm -hmm. and it's just absolutely spectacular. He's done it all himself on a very low budget with materials that he found around his property, a lot of plants donated by his neighbors and it's just something that's very, very spectacular, and you don't want to miss that one. Well, I was very impressed when I saw this, especially when I heard that he had done this all himself. Right. He uh, has done it all within the last year, so it's really spectacular. Well, uh, again, a really cool one to add to the list, and again, kind of uh, helps with the regional nature of, the, of the, the tour. Right. The next one is one that will be on uh, the night uh, uh, tour, and this is owned by Betty and Ralph. Right. Now, Betty and Ralph have something completely different from anything else that you'll see on the tour. They've converted their backyard into a complete outdoor room. Uh, they used a flagstone to make a pervious of floor so mm -hmm. that the rain can get through to feed the trees. Their pond is in the middle of this floor. They have a dining area with uh, fans over the dining area and over the bar. They've mm -hmm. built a potting shed okay. that is a great big uh, white rock room that's built around a uh, an oak tree and they used it to overwinter their plants as well as to store their uh, their uh, tools in but uh, it's something spectacular it's a certified wildlife habitat as well and their front yard is zero escaped with a very interesting graphic design that shows that zero escape doesn't have to be uh, very sterile or or uh, you know country looking. Okay. And I was, I had never seen uh, that kind of uh, fancy or elaborate uh, gravel work that actually looks like European inspired designs in the gravel. I yeah. think that's very cool. Yeah. Well, it, it, this one is really special and uh, I do love the way that they uh, incorporated the pond space because it's got a, a kind of for, uh, informal, formal quality at the exactly. same time. Exactly. Exactly. Really, very yeah. nice. It's, it's also uh, one of the ponds that's on the night tour that mm -hmm. night, so seeing it lit up will add a lot okay. of drama yeah. to it. The uh, next one was featured as a, uh, one of our featured uh, ponds last year, and actually we created a, a nice a video of it. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is one that incorporates lots of vessels and, and pots. Right. They have a 5,000 gallon pond, regular pond, but they also have about 25 different kinds of vessels that they have made little water features out of. Uh, one at their front door is a blue pot that is fed by a rain chain that comes off the gutter. And uh, Gary has rigged up a real interesting interesting way to feed that pot, so you'll want to ask them about that when you go out there. But they also have a Civil War era cannibal pot that okay. they've made into a water feature, and that's something you'll really want to find out what that is. Uh, I'm afraid to ask questions <laughs> about a cannibal pot. <laughs> <laughs> the Bastrop is in the tour this year as well. Yes, that's our farthest south and farthest east uh, we've ever had the tour go mm -hmm. out. But the pond that's out there, uh, owned by BJ and Sam, 
uh, is really spectacular. Another new pond that was just built last year. Uh, it features two ponds connected by a stream. And what I think is most interesting about it is the two ponds are actually separate. They look like they're connected. Uh, the bridge over the stream hides the fact that they are actually two separate ponds. Mm -hmm. So it makes it easy if, uh, if there's a problem with one pond or the other, they can shut the one down and uh, transfer the, the plants and the fish over to the other one while they work on it. I plan to expand my own pond and I want to do that same trick. That way you have, uh, you can add on without having to shut your whole pond down while well, you do it. Well, this is really a lovely uh, pond, actually a series of ponds, and it's on the edge of a golf course. Yes, it's just it's a beautiful a, setting. Yes. Beautiful setting and beautiful it's town well worth of Bastrop. The trip to Bastrop. All right. Uh, and and we have a, a one out in Steiner Ranch as well, owned by Ted and, and Michelle. Right, and this pond was on the tour in 2009, but he at that time he only had the one 5,000 gallon koi pond. He's added two ponds since then, so that's one thing that's important for people to understand is just because a pond has been on the tour before, don't miss going to it because pond owners never stop changing their ponds. <laughs> right. There's always something new to see. So he has two additional ponds with a waterfall going into that uh, uh, main koi pond and uh, it's a spectacular setting he's built it all of himself and uh, some really interesting plants around it as well great great and then we're going to uh, conclude talking about the ponds with a, a garden that I have seen and uh, design and with the water features designed by David Mahler and I have to say the uh, one of the most artful uh, uh, designers I've ever seen in terms of ponds and stonework and streams. Uh, David just does spectacular work. Mm -hmm. Yes, this uh, location is just amazing and it's in uh, Westlake Hills owned by Dan and Paula. Um, it's the largest pond installation on the tour I believe. Uh, the, he has a starts with a pond up in front of the house that runs into a stream that appears to disappear underneath the house and then as you walk around to the back side of the house, there's actually a grotto built into the back of the house itself. And the grotto, I have to say, this is something that should not be missed by anybody on the tour. It's it's, absolutely, if you have the opportunity to see this, you have to go. It's absolutely yeah. amazing. There are trails leading uh, all around the, the stream and ponds continue on down the hillside. And Westlake Hills is a great place for dramatic uh, water movement. And uh, Dave Mahler and uh, some of his people will be there to answer questions about that installation. Well, it, it, it genuinely uh, is superb, as are all the ponds that we've looked at here. This is an impressive assortment that you've lined up this year. Again, it's a two-day event. Mm -hmm. Give us the date again real quickly. June 8th and 9th. All right. Saturday day and Sunday day from uh, 9 to 5, Saturday night from 8 to 10.30. And, and the ponds, are, is, uh, are the, all the ponds open on both days? No, the north ponds are open oh. on Saturday okay. and the south on Sunday. You can go to our website at austinpondsociety.org, get all the information as well as download a brochure. Okay, well, uh, continued great work and congratulations on yet again another spectacular Austin Pond Society tour. Thanks so much for coming on the program and sharing all this good information with us. I think there are going to be a lot of people out there starting ponds this year in Central <laughs> Texas. So thanks again, Kathy, and good to see you and welcome back. And uh, now we're going to turn it over to our friend Daphne. Hi, I'm Daphne Richards, and this is Augie. Our question this week is about using weeds in the compost pile. Is it okay? Well, that depends. If you're working with a hot compost pile, it's fine to put weeds in it. But if you're using a cold composting method, it would be best not to. So what's the difference between hot and cold composting? Hot compost piles are active, and cold compost piles don't decompose all that quickly. The best way to compost is the hot method. But many people don't have the time, so they just pile up their yard waste in a corner and let it be. Organic matter left this way will decompose eventually, but it'll take a while. And since the pile doesn't ever get hot, most weed seats can just sit there and wait until you use that organic matter in your garden, where they'll be happy to sprout and take up valuable garden space. And you'll have a great opportunity to exercise your biceps hoeing them out. So if you're cold composting, toss the weeds into paper yard waste bags, leave them by the curb, and let the city compost them. But if you have the time to build a hot compost pile, you can compost your weeds, seeds and all. Active compost piles heat up to about 150 degrees, which is hot enough to cook most seeds. 
In order to build up this heat, your pile needs to be at least three feet tall and three feet wide. There are lots of ways to contain a compost pile, including prefab and home-built bins. The ratio of brown materials to green materials is also important, two-thirds brown to one-third green. Examples of brown materials are leaves and old mulch, while grass clippings and kitchen waste are green. I highly recommend investing in a compost thermometer so you can watch the temperature of the pile. If the pile is decaying properly, the temperature will rise very quickly and then fall slowly back below 100. That means it's time to turn the pile. If you'd like to learn more about composting, you're in luck. Extension's hosting a workshop on Saturday, June 15th. Check out my blog, centraltexashorticulture.blogspot.com for the details. Our plant this week is Tacoma X Orange Jubilee. Many people call this plant Esperanza, but others use the common name Yellow Bells since the flowers are long, tubular, and bell-shaped. The common species has large yellow flowers, but this cultivar, as its name implies, has orange flowers. The leaves of Orange Jubilee are a deep, glossy green with a glossy brightness to them. You may see this plant listed as a semi-evergreen, but it will usually be deciduous here in Central Texas. In cold winters, Orange Jubilee will freeze to the ground, but unless it's unusually cold, this root-hardy shrub will come back when spring temperatures warm up sufficiently, so you'll need to prune out all of the dead stems. Even if Orange Jubilee doesn't freeze to the ground, you might consider pruning it to about three inches from the ground anyway, since that will make the plant fuller and bushier. This fast-growing shrub loves the full hot sun, so it would do very well in a southern exposure, where you might have too much reflected heat for anything else to survive. Orange Jubilee can tolerate virtually any soil type and will grow very quickly to cover over 10 feet tall and six feet wide. This gorgeous shrub thrives on very low water, so if you're looking for a virtually carefree plant, Orange Jubilee would be a great choice. To do in your garden this week, plant a few last minute vegetables. Malabar spinach, okra, and southern peas love the heat, so get those transplants out now. It's also time to plant sweet potato slips. And if you're feeling adventurous, or perhaps looking for your next gardening challenge to experiment with, it's time to plant peanuts. We'd love to hear from you, so please visit KLRU.org with your questions and plants of the week from your garden. Thanks, Daphne. Now let's check in with Backyard Basics. Hello, gardening friends. I'm John Dromgool. Well, you may have seen them out there at the nurseries. Um, they've been around for a couple of years. Actually, they've been around since the 1920s. The Japanese and the Koreans have been doing something called grafting with the vegetables. and. Um, I brought some of them. Tomatoes are one of the more popular ones being grafted. You know, one of the, hap one of the things that happens is you get four to five times more production, four to five times more production on these grafted tomatoes than you would on, on the standard one. And so um, the graft is an important part of this whole thing because it has another root system that is um, um, more vigorous, and that's where this uh, quality comes from in the production of more tomatoes. Some of the heirloom varieties are being grafted because you've probably grown them and seen that production isn't all that great. The quality of the vegetable is fine, the quality of the tomatoes are fine, but the, um, the production just isn't there. Something like this costs around $10. But then you get much more uh, other qualities to them, like disease resistance. I've grown these in the past and um, tested them a couple times before they uh, came onto the market, and they were fantastic. I really did uh, find these to be very different than what we've been doing for many years. And so um, I'm real impressed by this. We tried some other varieties a few years ago, and they didn't do as well as uh, these um, newer ones that are coming out. They're good looking plants and, and when you look at them you'll see that the disease resistance is there. You won't see hardly a yellow leaf on them at all and if you've grown tomatoes before you've seen that um, pretty soon you get early blight or late blight, some of these problems and um, I haven't witnessed them on there. So the value comes in with that also. You don't have to be out there spraying. One of the other qualities that uh, several other types of tomatoes uh, have is that nematodes are not a problem. Nematodes attack the root system and really take the vigor out of some of these plants. So we have increased um, longer production right into the extreme conditions of the summertime and um, even poor soils. Um, they do better in the poor soils in these extremely well-built gardens, which is fine. 
I think that that's an important thing to do in the garden anyway. And when you do that, production is really far up there. So um, whether it's an eggplant, uh, tomato, or peppers, take a look at these peppers. This is a young plant right here, and it is full of peppers already. So that's um, really a quality that is very observable. The tomatoes will come along and in the heat um, just grow like you've not seen others uh, produce before. The taste of these tomatoes is really superior. Production, four to five times more. I think you begin to see the value of a tomato, a pepper, or an eggplant that um, is much more productive. Uh, insect and disease resistance, yes, insects uh, don't attack these as much as you've seen on some of the other ones in your garden. I would um, really uh, encourage you to try them. They do very well. You'll be impressed when you start. Try the tomatoes first, and you're going to see the high quality of the uh, production of these plants. So grafting is something that's uh, new and um, I think a very important thing to be doing. For Backyard Basics, I'm John Dromgoole. I'll see you next time. Find out more at klru.org slash ctg and join us on Facebook. Next week, Lucinda Hudson takes us on a spirited tour of Viva Tequila. Until then, I'll see you in the garden. To learn about today's program, watch online and follow CTG's blog, check out klru.org slash ctg. Support for Central Texas Gardener comes from GeoGrowers, offering custom soil blends for lawns, gardens, xeriscaping, and organic landscaping supplies. More information at geogrowers.net.